Hi again, I'm Jutta Bergler Klein, and now we will look at special circumstances in aortic stenosis. Some special circumstances to consider in aortic stenosis that we are going to look at is especially atrial fibrillation and arrhythmias, aortic stenosis and reduced left ventricular function. What do we do if we have secondary LVOT obstruction, aortic stenosis and aortic regurgitation? and the phenomenon of pressure recovery, which can lead to overestimation of aortic stenosis by Doppler. If we have aortic stenosis in atrial fibrillation, it's very important to take either an average beat or to take 10 to 15 beats and calculate an average of these beats of the AV velocities. Of course, we also have to remember to take an average either beat of the LVOT velocity or again take 10 to 15 beats and calculate the mean of these beats in the velocity. If we have aortic stenosis and reduced left ventricular function, we will have lower gradients than we would expect. First, we have to consider what are the causes of LV dysfunction. Is the left ventricle reduced in its function as a sequel of severe aortic stenosis? Or does this patient have cardiomyopathy or perhaps coronary artery disease leading to scarring such as you can see in patients after myocardial infarction? If we have low gradient, low flow aortic stenosis, this is defined as having a mean gradient below 30 to 40 millimeters of mercury, depending on the literature. It is defined as having a calculated valve area below one square centimeter and having an injection fraction below 40%. Here on the right, you can see in the apical long axis a highly reduced left ventricular function with a severely hypokinetic or even akinetic apical area. Perhaps this patient has ischemic heart disease leading to low output and we can see the heavily calcified aortic valve. So does this patient have low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis? When we perform the Doppler, we'll find lower mean gradients than we might expect. We will have a mean gradient of 30 to 40 millimeters mercury with, of course, a low AV velocity. Look here on the right. The AV velocity is only 3.6 meters per second. And in the calculation, we will have a valve area below 1. And if we do a Simpson's ejection fraction, we will have an EF below 40%. So in low gradient, low flow aortic stenosis, we will have features of severe aortic stenosis with a valve area below 1 and a reduced left ventricular function. From a clinical standpoint, it's very important to differentiate between patients with gradients above 40 compared to patients with mean gradients below 30 or 40 millimeters mercury. Patients who still have high gradients usually will improve their left ventricular function after valve replacement. When a patient has a mean gradient above 40, this patient has severe aortic stenosis and should be sent to valve replacement. However, if a patient has a gradient below 30 or 40, Again, we have to differentiate into patients who have true severe aortic stenosis versus those patients with only pseudo-severe aortic stenosis. How do we do that? We do a dobutamine stress echo. If a patient has pseudo-severe aortic stenosis, there is usually underlying cardiomyopathy or ischemic heart disease with lots of scarring and these patients have a very high operative risk with up to 30% mortality. However, the patients with true severe aortic stenosis 
usually will improve after valve replacement and the left ventricular function can be at least in part be restored. So what are factors in favor of true severe aortic stenosis even before we perform dobutamine stress echo? When we see patients with heavily calcified valves, this is very suspicious of severe aortic stenosis. If you have a late peak in the Doppler AV signal, this is also very indicative of severe aortic stenosis. If the patient has left ventricular hypertrophy, especially in the absence of severe hypertension, then this is probably due to valve stenosis. And of course, if the patient in previous exams had higher gradients than when you see the patient again, this points to LV deterioration due to severe stenosis. This is a typical example of a patient with low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis. Look at the highly reduced left ventricular function. The left ventricle is clearly dilated. And you can see the heavily calcified aortic valve, which is only opening a little bit and so in this patient, we would have to perform a dobutamine stress echo to see if this is really true severe aortic stenosis or whether this patient has underlying cardiomyopathy in a sense of pseudosevere aortic stenosis. Let's look at the algorithm of dobutamine stress in patients with aortic stenosis and low mean gradients below 30 millimeters mercury and an EF below 40% and a calculated valve area below 1. If the patient has true severe aortic stenosis, with dobutamine stress, you will see an increase of mean gradient above 40. If the patient has contractile reserve, then we see in it an increase of ejection fraction and cardiac output and a calculated stroke volume increase of more than 20%. And if this is the case, the aortic valve area in true severe aortic stenosis stays very much the same or clearly below one square centimeter. If the patient, however, has pseudosevere aortic stenosis, the cardiac output will increase with dobutamine as the valve opens better the mean gradient does not increase, it stays low, whereas now the calculated valve area will increase and will be above the severe cutoff of one square centimeter. If the patient does not have contractile reserve, then it can be very difficult to determine the severity of aortic stenosis. The mean gradient will not change very much, the cardiac output will probably stay low, pretty much the same. And of course, if the patient does not have contractor reserve, there will be no change in valve cusp opening and the valve area will stay below one square centimeters. In my experience, these patients should be considered perhaps for percutaneous transhemoral valve replacement because in recent studies it was seen that even these patients without contractor reserve can improve their ventricular function after valve replacement, but with conventional surgery they have a very high operative risk. So these patients might be candidates for the new cutaneous techniques. Here's a nice example of a patient with contractile reserve and true severe aortic stenosis. You can see here on the left side that the resting velocity in the LVOT is only 0.6. If you have a patient with a low velocity below one meter in the LVOT, this always points to reduced left ventricular function. The resting AV velocity is only 3.3 meters per second and when we give the patient dobutamine, we will see a significant increase of peak AV velocity up to 4.4, pointing to severe aortic stenosis. And this patient 
also demonstrates contractor reserve with a clear increase of more than 20% in the LVOT velocity and if you calculate the stroke volume this will come up to more than 20% increase of stroke volume up here in the, to a velocity of 1.3 meters in the LVOT under peak dobutamine stress. Only recently the new entity of paradoxical low flow low gradient aortic stenosis has been described. So what is that? In these patients we have severe aortic stenosis with only low gradients despite normal ejection fraction. So these patients actually have a valve area below 1, an EF above 50%, but still the mean gradient comes up to only below 40. So how can that be? These patients have an underlying low flow and when you calculate the stroke volume or even the stroke volume index, this shows up to be in a low range and when you calculate um, the stroke volume uh, on the body surface area, you will have a stroke volume index below 35 milliliters per square meters. So very frequently in these patients you find a high-grade concentric left ventricular hypertrophy with a very small left ventricle and usually these patients will have a restrictive or severe diastolic filling pattern. Again a calcified aortic valve will point towards a severe aortic stenosis and very often these patients have a long-standing history of hypertension and um, this causes uh, additional left ventricular hypertrophy and low flow. So the most important thing is in clinical daily life to think of paradoxical low flow aortic stenosis. When you see a patient with severely calcified aortic valve and a calculated valve area below one, even if this patient has only a low mean gradient. Another situation which can be clinically quite challenging is when you have a patient with aortic stenosis in a secondary left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. Usually you find left ventricular hypertrophy and you can have uh, quite some hypertrophy of the proximal septum and you will see a small left ventricle and perhaps even a hyperdynamic left ventricle. Look here at the turbulences that you see at the proximal septal site pointing to obstruction. Furthermore, there is some mitral regurgitation here with an eccentric jet, probably caused by a SAM phenomenon, a systolic anterior movement of the mitral valve caused by the LVOT obstruction. Here on the left side we also have a patient with severe concentric left ventricular hypertrophy as we can frequently find also in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and here again in the patient with the LVOT obstruction here caused by a hypertrophy in the proximal septum we will usually find the typical dagger shaped signal of hypertrophic obstruction or LVOT obstruction and this needs to be differentiated to the AV velocity in the valvular stenosis. Look here also on the left side, note the SAM phenomenon. Very often we have combined aortic stenosis and aortic regurgitation, especially of course in bicuspid valves or if the patient had endocarditis with aortic stenosis or if there is annular dilatation or aortic aneurysm 
In these cases, we will encounter elevated LVOT or aortic valve flow leading to high to high LVOT velocities and turbulences. Stenosis in aortic regurgitation. We can actually have overestimation of aortic stenosis severely. We can use the left ventricular size to estimate the severity of aortic stenosis and also signs of volume overload. This phenomenon is of course relevant if the auric regurgitation is more than moderate and we will have much higher aortic gradients if the aortic regurgitation is severe. Another interesting situation we can encounter is when the patient has aortic stenosis and severe mitral stenosis or mitral regurgitation. When a patient has severe mitral disease, this can lead to low flow and low stroke volume. And when we have a low flow over the stenotic aortic valve, we will have an underestimation of the severity due to low aortic gradients. This again is an example of the paradoxical low flow aortic stenosis. Another thing to consider is the phenomenon of pressure recovery. This image shows you the physics underlying this pressure recovery uh, phenomenon. What happens actually is that after the stenosis, you will have a pressure drop due to turbulences over the stenosis and energy loss. Of course, there is a very complicated formula that we don't have to apply in daily life. It's just a thing to keep in mind. What happens is that you have an increase of pressure downstream from the stenosis caused by reconversion of kinetic energy to potential energy. And so we can have an overestimation of the gradients by the eco-doppler in comparison to the catheter gradients. This is dependent on the area of measurement. In the Doppler, in eco, we measure at the maximum pressure drop, whereas in the catheter lab, we measure at the region where the pressure recovery has already occurred. And so this can explain a discrepancy of gradients measured in eco or in catheter lab. When can this be relevant? Especially in patients with a small aorta, an aorta ascendance below 30 millimeters. In these patients, we have to consider pressure recovery. If we have a patient with moderate aortic stenosis, we also have to think of pressure re recovery because, of course, if we put this patient into the class of severe aortic stenosis, this is important for prognosis and outcome of the patient. If we have underlying high flow rate, for example, in hyperdynamic left ventricular function or perhaps also in aortic regurgitation or in patients with thyroid disease or in patients who have tachycardia and very fast heart rate, this might be something that we have to consider. Sometimes we can also encounter this in bileaflet prosthesis or if the patient has a very funnular obstruction. So in my experience, it's really important to actually look at the valve. When you have a patient with heavy calcification, you can expect to find a severe aortic stenosis. There's really just one exception. When the patient has a bicuspid valve, especially in young patients, these patients frequently almost have no calcification and still have severe aortic stenosis.